Chapter 10, Leave Taking A single lantern, its shutters half-closed, hung from a nail on a stall post, casting a dim light. Deep shadows swallowed most of the stalls. As Rand came through the doors from the stable yard, hard on the heels of Matt and the warder, Perrin leaped up in a rustle of straw from where he had been sitting with his back against a stall door. A heavy cloak swathed him. Lon barely paused to demand, Did you look the way I told you, blacksmith? I looked, Perrin replied. There's nobody here but us. Why would anybody hide, care, and a long life go together, blacksmith? The warder ran a quick eye around the shadowed stable in the deeper shadows of the hayloft above, then shook his head. No time, he muttered, half to himself. Hurry, she says. As if to suit his words, he strode quickly to where the five horses stood tethered, bridled, and saddled at the back of the pool of light. Two were the black stallion and white mare that Rand had seen before. The others, if not quite so tall or so sleek, certainly appeared to be among the best the two rivers had to offer. With hasty care, Lon began examining cinches and girth straps, and the leather ties that held saddlebags, water skins, and blanket rolls behind the saddles. Rand exchanged shaky smiles with his friends, trying hard to look as if he really was eager to be off. For the first time, Matt noticed the sword at Rand's waist and pointed to it. You becoming a warder? He laughed, then swallowed it with a quick glance at Lon. The warder apparently took no notice. Or at least a merchant's guard. Matt went on with a grin that seemed only a little forced. He hefted his bow. An honest man's weapon isn't good enough for him. Rand thought about flourishing the sword but Lon being there stopped him. The warder was not even looking in his direction, but he was sure the man was aware of everything that went on around him. Instead, he said with exaggerated casualness, it might be useful, as if wearing a sword were nothing out of the ordinary. Perrin moved, trying to hide something under his cloak. Rand glimpsed a wide leather belt encircling the apprentice blacksmith's waist, with the handle of an axe thrust through a loop on the belt. What do you have there? He asked. Merchant's guard, indeed. Matt hooted. The shaggy-haired youth gave Matt a frown that suggested he had already had more than his fair share of joking, then sighed heavily and tossed back his cloak to uncover the axe. It was no common woodsman's tool. A broad half-moon blade on one side of the head and a curved spike on the other made it every bit as strange for the two rivers as Rand's sword. Perrin's hand rested on it with a sense of familiarity, though. Master Luhan made it about two years ago for a wool buyer's guard. But when it was done, the fellow wouldn't pay what he had agreed, and Master Luhan would not take less. He gave it to me when he cleared his throat, then shot Rand the same warning frown he'd given Matt when he found me practicing with it. He said I might as well have it since he couldn't make anything useful from it. Practicing, Matt snickered, but held up his hands soothingly when Perrin raised his head. As you say, it's just as well one of us knows how to use a real weapon. That bow is a real weapon, Lon said suddenly. He propped an arm across the saddle of his tall black and regarded them gravely. So are the slings I've seen you village boys with. Just because you never use them for anything but hunting rabbits or chasing a wolf away from the sheep makes no difference. Anything can be a weapon, if the man or woman who holds it has the nerve and will to make it so. Trollocs aside, you had better have that clear in your minds before we leave the two rivers, before we leave Emmons Field, if you want to reach Tarvalin alive. His face and voice, cold as death and hard as a rough-hewn gravestone, stifled their smiles and their tongues. Perrin grimaced and pulled his cloak back over the axe. Matt stared at his feet and stirred the straw on the stable floor with his toe. The warder grunted and went back to his checking, and the silence lengthened. It isn't much like the stories, Matt said, finally. I don't know, Perrin said sourly. Trollocs, a warder, and I said I. What more could you ask? I said I. Matt whispered, sounding as if he were suddenly cold. Do you believe her, Rand? Perrin asked. I mean, what would Trollocs want with us? As one, they glanced at the warder. Lon appeared absorbed in the white mare's saddle girth, but the three of them moved back toward the stable door, away from Lon. Even so, they huddled together and spoke softly. Rand shook his head. I don't know, but she had it right about our farms being the only ones attacked and they attacked Master Luhan's house and the forge first, here in the village. I asked the mayor. It's as easy to believe they are after us as anything else I can think of. Suddenly he realized they were both staring at him. You asked the mayor? Matt said incredulously. She said not to tell anybody. I didn't tell him why I was asking, Rand protested. Do you mean you didn't talk to anybody at all? You didn't let anybody know you're going? Perrin shrugged defensively. 
Moraine Sedai said not anybody. We left notes, Matt said. For our families. They'll find them in the morning. Rand, my mother thinks Tarvalin is the next thing to Sheol goal. He gave a little laugh to show he did not share her opinion. It was not very convincing. She'd try to lock me in the cellar if she believed I was even thinking of going there. Master Luhan is stubborn as stone, Perrin added, and Mistress Luhan is worse. If you'd seen her digging through what's left of the house, saying she hoped the Trollocs did come back so she could get her hands on them. Burn me, Rand, Matt said. I know she's an Aes Sedai and all, but the Trollocs were really here. She said not to tell anybody. If an Aes Sedai doesn't know what to do about something like this, who does? I don't know. Rand rubbed at his forehead. His head hurt. He could not get that dream out of his mind. My father believes her. At least, he agreed that we had to go. Suddenly Moraine was in the doorway. You talk to your father about this journey? She was clothed in dark gray from head to foot, with a skirt divided for riding astride, and the serpent ring was the only gold she wore now. Ran at her walking staff, despite the flames he had seen, there was no sign of charring or even soot. I couldn't go off without letting him know. She eyed him for a moment with pursed lips before turning to the others. And did you also decide that a note was not enough? Matt and Perrin talked on top of each other, assuring her they had only left notes, the way she had said. Nodding, she waved them to silence, and gave Rand a sharp look. What is done is already woven in the pattern. Lawn. The horses are ready, the warder said, and we have enough provisions to reach Bear Lawn with some despair. We can leave at any time. I suggest now. Not without me. Egwin slipped into the stable, a shawl-wrapped bundle in her arms. Rand nearly fell over his own feet. Lance's sword had come half out of its sheath. When he saw who it was he shoved the blade back, his eyes suddenly flat. Perrin and Matt began babbling to convince Moiraine they had not told Egwene about leaving. The Aes Sedai ignored them. She simply looked at Egwene, tapping her lips thoughtfully with one finger. The hood of Egwene's dark brown cloak was pulled up, but not enough to hide the defiant way she faced Moiraine. I have everything I need here, including food, and I will not be left behind. I'll probably never get another chance to see the world outside the two rivers. This isn't a picnic trip into the Waterwood, Egwene, Matt growled. He stepped back when she looked at him from under lowered brows. Thank you, Matt. I wouldn't have known. Do you think you three are the only ones who want to see what's outside? I've dreamed about it as long as you have, and I don't intend to miss this chance. How did you find out we were leaving? Rand demanded. Anyway, you can't go with us. We aren't leaving for the fun of it. The Trollocs are after us. She gave him a tolerant look, and he flushed and stiffened indignantly. First, she told him patiently, I saw Matt creeping about, trying hard not to be noticed. Then I saw Perrin attempting to hide that absurd great axe under his cloak. I knew Lon had bought a horse, and it suddenly occurred to me to wonder why he needed another. And if he could buy one, he could buy others. Putting that with Matt and Perrin sneaking about like bull calves pretending to be foxes, well, I could see only one answer. I don't know if I'm surprised or not to find you here, Rand, after all your talk about daydreams. With Matt and Perrin involved, I suppose I should have known you would be in it, too. I have to go, Egwene, Rand said. All of us do, or the Trollocs will come back. The Trollocs. Egwene laughed incredulously. Rand, if you've decided to see some of the world, well and good, but please spare me any of your nonsensical tales. It's true, Perrin said as Matt began. The Trollocs, enough, Moraine said quietly, but it cut their talk as sharply as a knife. Did anyone else notice all of this? Her voice was soft, but Egwene swallowed and drew herself up before answering. After last night, all they can think about is rebuilding, that and what to do if it happens again. They couldn't see anything else unless it was pushed under their noses. And I told no one what I suspected. No one. Very well, Moraine said after a moment. You may come with us. A startled expression darted across Lan's face. It was gone in an instant, leaving him outwardly calm, but furious words erupted from him. No, Moiraine. It is part of the pattern. Now, Lon. It is ridiculous, he retorted. There's no reason for her to come along, and every reason for her not to. There is a reason for it, Moiraine said calmly. A part of the pattern, Lon. The warder's stony face showed nothing, but he nodded slowly. But, Egwene. Rand said. The Trollocs will be chasing us. We won't be safe until we get to Tarvalin. Don't try to frighten me off, she said. I am going. Rand knew that tone of voice. 
He had not heard it since she decided that climbing the tallest trees was for children, but he remembered it well. If you think being chased by Trollocs will be fun, he began, but Moraine interrupted. We have no time for this. We must be as far away as possible by daybreak. If she is left behind, Rand, she could rouse the village before we have gone a mile, and that would surely warn the Murdral. I would not do that, Egwene protested. She can ride the Gleeman's horse, the warders said. I'll leave him enough to buy another. That will not be possible, came Tom Marilyn's resonant voice from the hayloft. Land sword left its sheath this time, and he did not put it back as he stared up at the Gleeman. Tom tossed down a blanket roll, then slung his cased flute and harp across his back and shouldered bulging saddlebags. This village has no use for me, now, while on the other hand, I have never performed in Tarvalin. And though I usually journey alone, after last night I have no objections at all to traveling in company. The warder gave Perrin a hard look, and Perrin shifted uncomfortably. I didn't think of looking in the loft, he muttered. As the long-limbed Gleeman scrambled down the ladder from the loft, Lon spoke, stiffly formal. Is this part of the pattern, too, Moraine said I? Everything is a part of the pattern, my old friend, Moraine replied softly. We cannot pick and choose. But we shall see. Tom put his feet on the stable floor and turned from the ladder, brushing straw from his patch-covered cloak. In fact, he said in more normal tones, you might say that I insist on traveling in company. I have given many hours over many mugs of ale to thinking of how I might end my days. A Trollocs cookpot was not one of the thoughts. He looked askance at the warder's sword. There's no need for that. I am not a cheese for slicing. Master Marilyn, Moraine said, we must go quickly, and almost certainly in great danger. The Trollocs are still out there, and we go by night. Are you sure that you want to travel with us? Tom eyed the lot of them with a quizzical smile. If it is not too dangerous for the girl, it can't be too dangerous for me. Besides, what Gleeman would not face a little danger to perform in Tarvalin? Moraine nodded, and Lon scabbard his sword. Rand suddenly wondered what would have happened if Tom had changed his mind, or if Moraine had not nodded. The Gleeman began saddling his horse as if similar thoughts had never crossed his mind, but Rand noticed that he had Lan's sword more than once. Now Moraine said, What horse for Egwene? The peddler's horses are as bad as the Durants, the warder replied sourly. Strong, but slow plotters. Bella, Rand said, getting a look from Lon that made him wish he had kept silent. But he knew he could not dissuade Egwene. The only thing left was to help. Bella may not be as fast as the others, but she's strong. I ride her sometimes. She can keep up. Lon looked into Bella's stall, muttering under his breath. She might be a little better than the others, he said finally. I don't suppose there is any other choice. Then she will have to do, Moraine said. Rand, find a saddle for Bella. Quickly, now. We have tarried too long already. Rand hurriedly chose a saddle and blanket in the tack room, then fetched Bella from her stall. The mare looked back at him in sleepy surprise when he put the saddle on her back. When he rode her, it was barebacked. She was not used to a saddle. He made soothing noises while he tightened the girth strap and she accepted the oddity with no more than a shake of her mane. Taking Egwene's bundle from her, he tied it on behind the saddle while she mounted and adjusted her skirts. They were not divided for riding astride, so her wool stockings were bared to the knee. She wore the same soft leather shoes as all the other village girls. They were not at all suited for journeying to Watch Hill, much less Tarvalin. I still think you shouldn't come, he said. I wasn't making it up about the Trollocs, but I promise I will take care of you. Perhaps I'll take care of you, she replied lightly. At his exasperated look, she smiled and bent down to smooth his hair. I know you'll look after me, Rand. We will look after each other. But now you had better look after getting on your horse. All of the others were already mounted and waiting for him, he realized. The only horse left riderless was Cloud, a tall gray with a black mane and tail that belonged to John Thane, or hat. He scrambled into the saddle though not without difficulty as the gray tossed his head and pranced sideways as Rand put his foot in the stirrup and his scabbard caught in his legs. It was not chance that his friends had not chosen Cloud. Master Thane often raced the spirited gray against merchants' horses, and Rand had never known him to lose, but he had never known Cloud to give anyone an easy ride, either. Lon must have given a huge price to make the miller sell. As he settled in the saddle Cloud's dancing increased, as if the gray were eager to run. Rand gripped the reins firmly and tried to think that he would have no trouble. Perhaps if he convinced himself, he could convince the horse, too. And all hooted in the night outside.
and the village people jumped before they realized what it was. They laughed nervously and exchanged shamefaced looks. Next thing, field mice will chase us up a tree, Egwene said with an unsteady chuckle. Lon shook his head. Better if it had been wolves. Wolves, Perrin exclaimed, and the warder favored him with a flat stare. Wolves don't like Trollocs, blacksmith, and Trollocs don't like wolves, or dogs, either. If I heard wolves I would be sure there were no Trollocs waiting out there for us. He moved into the moonlit night, walking his tall black slowly. Moraine rode after him without a moment's hesitation, and Egwene kept hard to the Aes Sedai's side. Rand and the Gleeman brought up the rear, following Matt and Perrin. The back of the inn was dark and silent, and dappled moon shadows filled the stable yard the soft thuds of the hooves faded quickly, swallowed by the night. In the darkness the warder's cloak made him a shadow, too. Only the need to let him lead the way kept the others from clustering around him. Getting out of the village without being seen was going to be no easy task, Rand decided as he neared the gate. At least, without being seen by villagers. Many windows in the village emitted pale yellow light. And although those glows seemed very small in the night now, shapes moved frequently within them, the shapes of villagers watching to see what this night brought. No one wanted to be caught by surprise again. In the deep shadows beside the inn, just on the point of leaving the stable yard, Lon abruptly halted, motioning sharply for silence. Boots rattled on the wagon bridge, and here and there on the bridge moonlight glinted off metal. The boots clattered across the bridge, grated on gravel, and approached the inn. No sound at all came from those in the shadow. Rand suspected his friends, at least, were too frightened to make a noise. Like him. The footsteps halted before the inn in the grayness just beyond the dim light from the common room windows. It was not until John Thane stepped forward, a spear propped on his stout shoulder, an old jerkin sewn all over with steel discs straining across his chest, that Rand saw them for what they were. A dozen men from the village and the surrounding farms, some in helmets or pieces of armor that had lain dust-covered in attics for generations, all with a spear or a wood axe or a rusty bill. The miller peered into a common room window, then turned with a curt, it looks right here. The others formed in two ragged ranks behind him, and the patrol marched into the night as if stepping to three different drums. Two Daval Trollocs would have them all for breakfast, Lon muttered when the sound of their boots had faded, but they have eyes and ears. He turned his stallion back. Come. Slowly, quietly, the warder took them back across the stable yard, down the bank through the willows and into the wine spring water. So close to the wine spring itself the cold, swift water, gleaming as it swirled around the horse's legs, was deep enough to lap against the soles of the rider's boots. Climbing out on the far bank, the line of horses round its way under the warder's deft direction, keeping away from any of the village houses. From time to time Lon stopped signing them all to be quiet, though no one else heard or saw anything. Each time he did, however, another patrol of villagers and farmers soon passed. Slowly they moved toward the north edge of the village. Rand peered at the high-peaked houses in the dark, trying to impress them on his memory. A fine adventurer I am, he thought. He was not even out of the village yet, and already he was homesick. But he did not stop looking. They passed beyond the last farmhouses on the outskirts of the village and into the countryside paralleling the north road that led to Terran Ferry. Rand thought that surely no night sky elsewhere could be as beautiful as the two-river sky. The clear black seemed to reach to forever, and myriad stars gleamed like points of light scattered through crystal. The moon, only a thin slice less than full, appeared almost close enough to touch, if he stretched, and a black shape flew slowly across the silvery ball of the moon. Rand's involuntary jerk on the reins halted the gray. A bat, he thought weakly but he knew it was not. Bats were a common sight of an evening, darting after flies and bite me's in the twilight. The wings that carried this creature might have the same shape, but they moved with the slow, powerful sweep of a bird of prey. And it was hunting. The way it cast back and forth in long arcs left no doubt of that. Worst of all was the size. For a bat to seem so large against the moon it would have had to be almost within arm's reach. He tried to judge in his mind how far away it must be, and how big. The body of it had to be as large as a man, and the wings. It crossed the face of the moon again, wheeling suddenly downward to be engulfed by the night. He did not realize that Lon had ridden back to him until the warder caught his arm. What are you sitting here and staring at, boy? We have to keep moving. The others waited behind Lon. Half expecting to be told he was letting fear of the Trollocs overcome his sense, Rand told what he had seen. 
He hoped that Lon would dismiss it as a bat, or a trick of his eyes. Lon growled a word, sounding as if it left a bad taste in his mouth. Drakar. Egwene and the other two rivers folk stared at the sky nervously in all directions, but the gleam had grown softly. Yes, Moraine said. It is too much to hope otherwise. And if the Murdral has a Drakar at his command, then he will soon know where we are, if he does not already. We must move more quickly than we can cross country. We may still reach Terran Ferry ahead of the Murdral, and he and his Trollocs will not cross as easily as we. A Drakar. Egwene said. What is it? It was Tom Marilyn who answered her hoarsely. In the war that ended the Age of Legends, worse than Trollocs and half men were created. Moraine's head jerked toward him as he spoke. Not even the dark could hide the sharpness of her look. Before anyone could ask the gleeman for more, Lon began giving directions. We take to the north road, now. For your lives, follow my lead. Keep up and keep together. He wheeled his horse about, and the others galloped wordlessly after him.